people think that being a star is about being fabulous, being in the spotlight, having your picture taken all the time and having everyone worship and adore you, being rich, 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 having it all. And you know what? They're absolutely right. Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. Uh, we are here with yet another Chad and Mo movie hour and keeping trend with the Madonna theme and the desperately seeking Susan moment. Um, we are continuing on with the epic documentary that set a precedent for all musical documentaries that would follow about pop stars, Truth or Dare. So um, we're going to be and. discussing and we're going to be discussing that and the more and the new documentary strike a pose which chronicles where these dancers from that documentary are present day and it's excellent it's a must 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 see documentary yeah. especially if you grew up watching the blonde ambition tour um and you grew up watching truth or dare yes 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 yes, yes. all right well i am going to with that yes I like the red. Yeah, bold. And I have nothing Madonna on. <laughs> this is an um, actual vintage 1990 shirt. Is um, it real? It's a mint. Pioneer. It's... Pioneer was like the sponsor of the tour, so okay. you don't really hear the, of them anymore. But yeah. No, they were like the premier stereo people. In, like, right, the electronics, laser disc. They released this tour on laser disc, and they had to deal with her. Uh, some people say that's why the tour never came out on Blu-ray as like the just the uncut tour. Yeah. Because they released it on like Laserdisc and um, I think in Japan like Laserdisc and VHS of the Japan show mm -hmm. and uh, the Nice show was released on Laserdisc in the U.S. which I have right here. Oh wow! This That's is the cool. the laser disc of the tour itself, <clears throat> but it never made the leap to DVD or Blu-ray. Unfortunately, um, the un the the footage used in the documentary Truth or Dare is 35 millimeter footage from Paris, and if only we could get that show like uncut release on Blu-ray, that'd be like yeah. the most incredible thing ever because the show itself is such an incredible work of art. Um, so this is the, the laser disc of the tour from um, Nice, France, and I have it signed by, I think, seven of the people related to the tour, not Madonna, but um, both backup singer, dancers, Nikki and Donna signed it, um, Kevin Stay, the dancer, signed it, Louis Camacho, the dancer, signed it, Carlton Wilburn, the dancer, signed it. Um, the director of Truth or Dare, whose name is Alec Kashishian, Alec yeah. Kashishian yeah, Alec. signed it, um, and I'm nervous. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Vincent Patterson, last but not least, Vincent Patterson, who is really, a, along with Madonna, the mastermind behind this tour, because he choreographed the whole show, um, also signed it. I met him at the LACMA in Los oh. Angeles. And um, so I met these people at various different places, but I attended two showings uh, in person of Strike Pose, the documentary with the dancers and the backup singers together there. One was at the Directors Guild in Los Angeles. And then I have the tour book from the tour, uh, which is amazing, of course. That was actually, uh, yeah. The cover of the tour book, that that portrait is actually um, the one that I wanted for my room. Um, and then I just accidentally wow. happened across the one that I have of her much younger at the uh, New York right. studio design. From the 70s. Uh, that's the Late original 70s. one I wanted for my bedroom. Yeah. That's and amazing. Your credentials, you know, precede you. So. Uh, yeah, I can talk this to death. I mean, so. Like, it's let's get into that. it. Um, you just recently saw Truth or Dare again. Oh, yeah. Yoda? Just, yes, I hi, Yoda. The babies. Um, yeah, so um, I just wanted so to say... So what were your impressions upon seeing this again, the, the Truth been, or Dare documentary? It had been um, at least 
maybe 15 years since I had seen it. It's been a long time. Um, and there was quite a bit that I had forgotten about and, you know, seeing it in the context of like knowing who Madonna is now in her life and in her career. Um, it's just, it's a completely different experience, but it was so, right. so like time machine -y and nostalgic. And I felt like, you know, a little kid again, watching it for the first time. And it's just such a beautiful, beautifully shot and edited and executed documentary. Like I said in the intro, it really does, it, it did uh, set the precedent for pop star documentaries, you know, with what you see with Lady Gaga, Katy Perry did one, the Taylor Swift one, like nothing right. will ever, ever compare. Yeah. The choice to shoot in black and white brilliant um but Madonna always thought that that uh black and white was like a lot more like blemish erasing and forgiving okay. and more like you know throwback to Marilyn Monroe and all the old stuff so she had a love affair with um black and white yeah yeah I mean the aesthetics, but that of, it alone, yeah. the aesthetics of it alone are, are beautiful but um there, there was and then, just... and then you have that larger than life color footage when she performs. She's performing, yeah. Yeah. The the way that they cut between the performances and the documentary footage is really well done, especially at the end when you get the final performance and it's the entire song has footage spliced into it as like the outro right before they yeah. play Trudy Dare. Um, keep it yeah. together. Yeah. <laughs> keep and it we together. and we we were just talking about how I have a Clockwork Orange poster here um, signed by Malcolm McDowell. And Clockwork Orange was the main inspiration for that song in the tour, um, from the bowler hats to all of her commentary in a British accent, saying stuff like a little bit of the old in out, in out, and all that. Yep. And I was today years old when I learned that, so I really need to go back and watch that performance again. Um, but yeah, you had mentioned off camera that this tour, the Blonde Ambition tour, was inspired. And that's the perfect yeah. articulation. I mean, I remember growing up, everyone was a Madonna fan, but my mom especially so. And back when HBO was like, you you were like fancy if you had HBO and we were blessed yeah. enough to have HBO. Um, I think my mom actually pirated it, but that's a different conversation. Um, <laughs> I think we were stealing the cable from the neighbors. Um, but anyway, um, you know, when, when Madonna would have a tour or a show de debut on HBO. It would de debut live and like the world stopped. You like every, you sat down and you watched Madonna on HBO at night or whenever it was. Right. And I remember I, I can be in my living room, like looking up at the TV like this for Blonde Ambition, for the girly show. Girly which was show. The tour. Um, Even um, Drown World Tour in 2001, they did it for, I think that was the lot. last one that they really did it for. Yeah, but, but um, inspired, inspired, yeah. Oh my God, and uh, same here, and I, those were so special to me. Um, I just remember they had a graphic that would come on, um, you can still see this on YouTube, but um, the graphic would come on the upper left top corner and it would say, like, via satellite from uh, oh, yeah, France. Yeah, yeah. yeah, live via satellite. So you knew it was, like, being beamed up and then beamed down through the magic of HBO. But, like, yeah. yes, so I saw that live. I'm so, I never saw the, the tour in, cons, uh, in person, of course, but I right. saw that HBO broadcast, you know, live when it was happening, and it was so exciting. <laughs> and I was taping it on VHS, and... Mm -hmm. uh, I had to watch it with my parents, which was mortifying, and <laughs> I, they wanted to kind of, um, yeah, after the Like a Virgin thing, it was, yeah. But I was taping it, and then that VHS got worn out, because I just played that over and over and over again. Um, yeah, and uh, we talked in a previous movie hour about how, um, how uh, you don't have stars in the same way as you did then with Michael Jackson and Madonna in particular, those two pop stars of that type of popular sound, you, it, you, that, that type of pop star has continued on and morphed and changed and multiplied, but um, diminished in like power and persona and mystique and just larger than life um, mythic type proportion to their fame. 
Um, yes. so we talked about that and that is on full display in this in this documentary like all of her glory and her power and um, the crowds chanting her name outside her hotel room. And um, <clears throat> it's so awesome that they filmed this and like captured that. And it's such mm -hmm. a great time capsule. Um, yes. Of course, Madonna executive produced it and was there in the editing room. Nothing is ever like just exactly how it was in real life, but it's great that it is a documentary that's not too uh, it, it is pretty straightforward the way it's done, but uh, Madonna had a heavy hand in it, of course, so there's something that she didn't want in there. But I think uh, the director, Alec Kashishian, was surprising her at every turn. And um, In what like, way? Like, there's a scene where she's confronted with one of her childhood um, mm -hmm. friends, Moira McFarlane. Moira. <laughs> and... Madonna actually didn't know that was, and I believe this, that that was going to happen until like the day of, and Alec was kind of scheming these things on the side. So she looks like a complete bitch. <laughs> and I would just say she was a bitch at the time, but not like a complete bitch, <laughs> like a heartless bitch. But of course she's like, I don't know if I can be your, your son's godmother or whatever. I have to think about it. <laughs> Well, and I mean, I think it's because she's so person. caught off guard, right? Yeah, but I mean, any rational person who has a friend that they haven't seen since what tenth grade that shows up and I is know. just like, "Oh, want to be my my new." Kid. It looks I worse than it is. It looks worse than it is. And um, <laughs> Moira's um, on the ass. Yeah, Moira. Oh my God, <laughs> she is. It's so funny. You can <laughs> tell that Madonna was kind of caught off guard. I think okay. Madonna mentioned her, and then Alec Kashishi and tracked her down on the sly. And like arranged like a run in, which was kind of sneaky. Um, yeah. Madonna would get him back in other ways. Like there was this elaborate setup where he was gonna film her um, dyeing her her roots blonde, like touching up her roots to that platinum iconic blonde. Mm -hmm. And he spent like hours, like like getting the lighting right. Maybe not hours, but you know, a good amount of time, like setting everything up. And then she just cavalierly was like, "I think we're gonna do it over here." And she would always mess with his shots so he couldn't get the, get that. Like, I don't know. There were little tit for tat things, but, yeah. um, but they're such a great duo together in, in making this. And while they were filming it, no one knew it was going to be theatrically released. Um, I don't know if Madonna did or not. It's not completely clear, but she kind of told people these are home movies. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And they were, uh, like, needless to say, this was not a home movie. This became, right. at the time, the highest grossing documentary of all time. And um, so it was widely released. And there's a lot in it that's kind of like scandalous and delicious in that way. She flashes her breasts at the camera. Of course, she has no qualms about that. Um, there's a Kevin Costner moment where, you know, she kind of mocks his she she calls it his aw shucks image, like his his uh, goody goody two shoes image, and yeah. she kind of like is like oh whatever, and and like gags on her finger at at the thought of him thinking her show is neat. Neat. But it it's really interesting to like really think about the dynamics of this and not take it at face value because he was there at her show, um, kind of um very earnestly interested in yeah. it. I don't think it's because he didn't get the show. I, I do think he's smart enough to like appreciate the show on its merits. Mm -hmm. And and then of course, um, later on, um, Madonna, as the 90s progressed, Madonna got more and more um, spiritual and became um, more concerned with like how she treated people and expressed in several interviews that maybe she wasn't the, the kindest person at the time of this documentary. And, yeah. and then later apologized from the stage to Kevin Costner um, for that, which I thought was nice of her. And I think we should commend her on trying to become like a better person. And I think the zenith of that was the ray of light era and the birth of her daughter, right. where she just totally transformed as a person. And but it was this interesting. Was like, but this oh, was the height of her ego. Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. And her and fame. Yeah, I mean, it, it can't be under the impact of the blonde ambition tour cannot be understated. But the um, Sindel's very enthused as well. But the um, <laughs> hi, Sindel. <laughs> okay, babies. Um, yes, like you, her ego. She, you know, we were shitting on Val Kilmer in a previous movie hour for a, a similar, you know, 
for similar context insofar as like right. he was a prima donna he he had a little bit of like a, a douchebag rep but again he was at the height of his career he was hot shit you know like he didn't have social he, media people got away with it more than right and i think that you know in in the you had sent me uh, the article that that recounts Ke- kevin costner's experience going back to see her with his kids after the fact and she just says stops the show at one point and says sorry kevin costner and gives the audience no context but right. in that interview Years he later. Said, yeah and, and in that interview he says i appreciate that she kept her own counsel and i think that speaks to what you're saying is you know she right. she didn't apologize because somebody forced her to she years later came to the conclusion that maybe like what the way she behaved on camera was not appropriate and I really appreciated that insight from him because that's exactly what happened you know she apologized on her own terms when she had come to the realization on her own right everything's on her own terms (laughs) (laughs) yeah and um I know, I know that you're a feminist and you're very interested in feminism yeah, yeah. and feminist history and studies. And um, so what's interesting is that feminists really were, were sort of outraged when Madonna first became really big with the Like a Virgin album because of, of her accessible sexuality. And that didn't really change until uh, Camille uh, uh, Palia wrote, um, the feminists wrote, this article on Madonna in 1990, right before this documentary came out, um, sort of um, claiming that Madonna, no, Madonna is the ultimate feminist, right? Because she's totally in control of her own image, her own sexuality, the choices are hers. She wants to make these choices. She's fully in control of her career in a male dominated industry like the recording industry was at the time. Um, she's calling all the shots creatively and in, um, in full control of like her finances and her business decisions, mm-hmm. which is kind of unprecedented for a female in in pop music. Maybe maybe there certainly were some other females really in control in different genres, more rock and stuff. But right. for like a pop star or a dance music artist to have that kind of control was definitely unprecedented, I think. And um and so the tides were turning in feminism, and um, I think Madonna was kind of a little bit ahead of her time in some ways. But um, yeah, the tides had turned for her, the narrative, like uh, culturally. So she mm-hmm. was coming just into more and more and more and more power. She was like a hurricane that was just like sucking up all the power um, from Like a Virgin through True Blue through um, Like a Prayer. And then into the height of it all, like it all climaxed with Truth or Dare, the Blonde Ambition Tour, Vogue. Um, right. So it is definitely um, the zenith of her, of her power and her career. And um, that's what makes it so exciting. And that's what makes it like uh, so incredible. Yes. And I think we have to work in the word zenith into every movie hour. So yeah. it's too yes, great. I'll try. It's too great. Um, yes. Yeah, I mean, you're obviously hitting the nails, all of the nails on all of the heads. She, even to this day, you know, it's remarkable how she's been able to, for the most part, still remain relevant, um, still remain controversial. But right. um, the the idea that she was forever for a for even a second out of control of the decisions that she made is just false i mean it's, everything right. she did was to provoke you know right. and i think that you know to your earlier point like you don't see that anymore like i think a lot of people will say well what about lady gaga and i'll say go fuck yourself you know like that's on a surface level madonna was was provocative in Right. Her DNA that, is, is provocative. Like everything she did was right. to elicit a response and a reaction. And it's hard to fathom now, especially for maybe like younger generations, what it was like and how provocative it really was. The amount of newsprint that was spent on like the outrage and just the, I mean, all the news. She was always on the late night news. Like they were always covering like every new hair color or scandalous outfit or um, nude photo or whatever it was always it was there was so much like buzz and conversation and outrage about her 
way more than you see about any one pop star now. Pop oh, yeah. stars just aren't covered that same way. Um, yeah. But it, so they were areas that were way more uncharted, like these sexual areas for a female in in music um, to to sort of um, explore. And yeah. that, that made it all the more relevant. And everyone knows this, but definitely Madonna was in charge of uh, knocking down all those doors for all the uh, female artists that followed. Yeah, I mean, it, again, the impact that she's had on my life, I, 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 I can't, <laughs> there aren't words. Um, and I'm not even I'm not even talking about musically how her music has moved me. Like she is somebody that I idolize even to this day. I mean she's not without her her issues, but I absolutely idolize her in in so many ways. And I think she's such an incredible role model for for young girls and and women. But to your point about you know the author that did the expose on her prior to the tour you know, and making the case that she is the ultimate feminist, I absolutely agree with that sentiment because if a woman is in control of her body and is unabashedly, like, open about her sexuality and um, not just in a performative way, but in a sincere way, like, that is absolutely beautiful to me. And I think, you know, with, with the simulated masturbation scene in the in the tour, which was, you know, the great controversy, especially when they were in Canada, they were going to shut the show down or arrest her rather. Arrest her, yeah. And she's like, I'm not going to change. I'd rather not do the show than change the show. Which is I mean, so commendable. I was like so thrilled with the way that she handled herself with that. And the Pope called this tour, um, the Blonde Ambition tour, one of the most satanic performances of all in in history um which i think is hilarious actually now but it was pope john paul ii and yeah. um of course he was wrong but um <laughs> i just had the chance to say the pope was wrong but yeah <laughs> um so when she was in the vatican she made this amazing speech and there's like a truncated uh, version of it in truth or dare where she talks mm -hmm. about um who she is as an italian american artist what American freedom and freedom of expression means to her. And it's so powerful and it's so good. And she was such a, a, a leader of, um, you know, those ideals and those um, full artistic and, and human freedom, just like completely being free and um, such a beautiful thing. And uh, yeah, so I, lo I love that, that speech she does um, when they finally get to, Italy, to, to Rome and, and, uh, yeah. Italy and um yeah it's incredible yeah I was just gonna say the same thing the the I, I would like to believe she wrote that on her own volition I I have no reason to think otherwise she sure did given the fact that she's in full control um which doesn't happen anymore you'd have a PR yeah, and it's really well art articulate it's extremely articulate and extremely well written she's a super intelligent person so yeah. I, I I just admire that so much yeah, and re-watching it, I was reminded of how, like, impactful that whole situation was when they were about to play Rome, and, you know, the, the, when, the only other time I remember the Pope really getting in, involved in a pop star was with Sinead O'Connor when she ripped up his picture. Right, but which I we was, all know now she was totally justified in doing because of all of the child molestation, and that's what she was getting at, but it was so far ahead of her time. And yeah. now we can retroactively go back and be like, you know what? She's pretty spot on. The dots, yeah. Yes. I, I wanted to just mention, you know, as somebody that grew up Roman Catholic and is Sicilian, like her also being an Italian American is something that is just amazing. And um, her relationship, and you might want to get into this. I don't know if this is sure. on, your, on your notes, but, you know, her relationship with C Catholicism and with the Catholic yeah. Church so interesting and beautiful you know she lost her mother when she was quite young you know and she has this um she, her catholicism is is performative in one way because she in, integrates it into her literal performances um aesthetically and otherwise but you know she is many more things than a catholic now but her relationship with that particular religion is just so interesting right. to me and, and i think um 
I, I just think that it's it, it's something that's worth uh, reminding ourselves of and mentioning. Exploring, yeah. Yeah, yeah for sure. I mean, she kind of had Catholicism on her own terms in a lot of ways, um, which is which is like, that was kind of novel too and like daring. But um, she found the beauty in it, right? Like we all can when we see, you know, the, the historical artwork that surrounds religion and all of the, all of that beauty in the churches and the buildings and um, stun, stunning levels of beauty. And so she yeah. incorporated that in the show and had the, you know, the stained glass in one section of the show. And I mean, all the candles, right? When you go and you light a candle, the ritual, the yeah. healing rituals that feel good when you do them. Um, so she actually had a lot of love for, for those, the aesthetic and the ritual of religion, but she also at the same time was questioning the, some of the hypocrisy in it or some of the um, oppressive nature of it, right? So uh, just so great and so interesting. And she was really um, exploring Catholicism a lot um, in 1989 and 1990 when the tour happened. In 89, on the, she did the Like a Prayer album and she had her songs like Oh Father and Like a Prayer and the music videos were highly charged with like religious imagery and that carried through right to the tour. And uh, I, I find that some of her best work for sure. And I mean, uh, it's um, very personal too, yeah. Like a Prayer, the, the song on its own is just, if you, if, if you never saw the music video and you just only had ever been introduced to the song, it's absolutely one of the most beautiful songs in my opinion ever. For sure. You introduce the, 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 the charged nature of that music video. And the, again, count how many times I say the impact can't be understated no. <laughs> or, or, or overstated rather like the, um, that video. I mean, if you're having right. sex with Jesus, you know, I'm here right. for it. She, on the one hand, she's, she's making this video and, and it's, she's got the choir and the church, the small church. And so she's celebrating the religion, but at the same time, she's going to kiss a black man in this video, which at the time, what now, you know, yeah. it's, it's not controversial, thankfully, right. but at the right. time that was extremely controversial and it even got her deal with Pepsi pulled. So she had a, a multi-million dollar deal with Pepsi Cola and um, when they saw the kissing of the black saints and the burning crosses, uh, in the video, probably they would say more, it was the burning crosses, but let's be right. serious. Yeah. Um, so she got to keep the money though. So she's just brilliant. But um, yeah, they pulled sponsorship. They were going to sponsor the Blonde Ambition Tour, Pepsi was, and then it became mm -hmm. Pioneer. Um, good good riddance, Pepsi. I mean. Right, who, who but, needs them? You but, said Mike. Uh, yeah, the, the video you. is so awesome with the the black saint uh, who comes to life and he's gorgeous and she's gorgeous and they have this like gorgeous kiss and the, the lighting is gorgeous and the whole thing is Perfect. just beautiful. Yeah, it's incredible. Her voice was so like crystalline at the time, very clear. And um, yeah, it's such a great time. I loved her style, her hair, her, her fashion, everything was just like so great. And it was so like right on the cutting edge at the time. And, yeah. you know, the tour, her fashion in the tour is incredible. She's working with um, Gaultier, okay. John Paul Gaultier, the incredible French um, icon of fashion, the Cone Bra, and collaborated with Madonna to come up with uh, a incredible, rich, large amount of costuming for this one tour which I don't really think had been done for a pop concert tour, along mm. with um, her headset microphone. Um, right. The headset microphone wasn't as popular either, but it allowed her to completely dance and also sing. Technology and the fashion of this tour, this tour had a huge hydraulic stage with lifts and stairs that could like um, reposition themselves and then multiple sets. And like, I mean, it blows my mind to see this this stage now because this stage is better than anything you see today mm -hmm. anything it had multiple sets it was like a full broadway i mean i think some broadway plays don't even have maybe like the the scope of of atmosphere right. that this this tour brought so i mean that she was such an innovator in that regard um the amount of intricate choreography by vincent patterson 
-hmm. So all these people, she's, she's a genius at choosing who to pull in to like really elevate that the costuming and the, the staging and the uh, technology of the sound and every, every aspect, the choreography with Vincent Patterson, um, just, she's pulling in these people that are like the best at what they do. Yeah. And that's, um, some people say that really her talent is, is doing that, but I disagree. I think she has, you know, as much talent as those people, but I mean, you have to assemble an army to pull something like this off. And she certainly did. Well, I think both, both, both are true. She, I, I believe she's a genius. I, I absolutely am not just throwing that word around because I know we all throw that word around um, like crazy. I think she's a genius. Um, maybe not a musical genius, but she's a genius in terms of uh, just creating an image, um, being a Renaissance woman, you know, acting. Having, having a voice through her artwork. Having a voice, being in control, just as a package, I think it, she's yeah. a genius. But it's also true um, that uh, knowing who to work with is just as important. I mean, that's and, a skill and, set too, right? Yeah, and she's brilliant at it. And you know, yeah. I did want to get your your thoughts. I mean, obviously, you like her voice because you like Madonna. Yeah. But her, I think it, it's just worth mentioning that her voice is is not only incredibly powerful. But it's incredibly unique. You know, she can go right and in the same line. When, she'll when you hear it, you know it's be, Madonna. Yeah, yeah. I mean, she'll go like really deep and be like almost right. like a bass tone, and then she'll like have right. that girly, that little girly voice. Right. And the way it just slides in and out yes. is just no one sounds. I know. Like it, it's so it's so in vogue to say that she can't sing, but um, not oh, true. Not true. And not time. only that, but she's worked harder and harder throughout the decades to become an even better technical singer and mm -hmm. you see her her you see a breakthrough around this time in 1990 with songs like oh father where she had a far more rich voice where she could go deep and she could whereas in the beginning she stayed in the high range and uh, people kind of um blasted her for that or whatever but that's what those pop songs really sure. required and then she was she was so much more like um warm and husky and like rich on this tour and she really i think this was her first like big vocal breakthrough i think yeah. and then you see it again in 1996 with avita where she took technical training to to like a a, a very strict regimen and became um technically way more proficient as as just a vocalist and then um she took that training and then brought it back to pop music with ray of light in 1998 where you, you hear her voice is incredible on Ray of Light. Like, her voice on Ray of Light is better than a lot of people. So let's that not awesome. say she's she can't sing. Yeah, yeah um, let's come correct. And, and yes. in, in the movie, specifically in Truth or Dare, in the performance of You Can't Hurt Me Now, you really... Yes, oh, like, Father. He showcases... Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's so good. And those are live vocals. Um, so... I don't know yeah. how much we want to peel back the curtain, but there is a little bit of pre-recorded vocals um, of in the show, which was kind of new at the time. They blend really, really well. With this level of choreography, I mean, there needed it, to be yeah. some vocal rest breaks. Of um, still, the majority, I would say like 80% of it is full mm -hmm. on live without a backing track at all. No mm -hmm. backing track. She had Nikki and Donna, which were backup singers but she didn't have a double of her voice, which is so right. par for the course now. Everybody does yeah. that. She was out there completely on her own with that Oh Father moment that was 100% live and chills, like just chills. Chills. All and that, that schoolgirl, like Catholic schoolgirl, like I'm, I'm so caught up in it. I, I was neither Catholic nor a schoolgirl, but I was with her in that moment. And that's the point, right? She brought you there. Yes. I mean, uh, I was reminded um, watching this again last night, just how impressive she is in, again, what we're talking a about. A yeah. fourth, you know, she's doing some of the most incredible choreography. She's working her ass off. When they were in Tokyo- You don't see I, that anymore. You don't. And like when they're in the Tokyo show, they're filming or they're performing 
throughout a snowstorm. Um, <laughs> yeah. you, really, you really get to see it, like, you can hear that she's really singing whilst, yes. like in holiday specifically, when she's yep. fucking jumping around and yeah. you can hear her sing through that. It's like the breath yes. control. Like, mm -hmm. don't come for Madonna no. unless you want to come for you. Just right. Don't. <laughs> I love you. I don't love do you so much. Um, don't. So well said. I'm so passionate about what you just said. And um, of course, we'll, we'll talk now that we're talking about her vocals. She had to actually take vocal breaths on this tour. Um, and they, she goes to the vo her, her voice doctor in this tour. Um, I've, seen, I've seen comments where people are like, well, why should someone who's a famous singer need a vocal coach? Everyone who's a singer should always keep a vocal coach because they, they keep you up on your training. It's just like having a personal trainer with your fitness. Right. Um, so it doesn't mean she couldn't sing or whatever. It means that she was concerned about her vocal health. And um, everyone should, everyone who's a serious singer should do that if they can, you know, yeah. if they have that luxury. And um, so she was pushing her, her voice really hard. She was performing a lot of back to back to back shows like she says in the documentary, and um, was was like going full voice. She wasn't holding back. Um, and I don't know, but, you know, she got laryngitis and then she had to cancel a few tour dates. But yeah. um, so that's interesting. But I, I just love her sound in this tour. And, um, you know, she's the tour is so technical and there's so much going on that she's it's surprising how well she still is on, on key and on note, um, mm. which isn't 100% of the time because it's live and um, because there's so much dancing and moving around. Right. But um, when she's on, she's on and it's incredible. Mm. Um, so I just wish, this is one of my go back in time moments. So if I could go back in time, I feel like I was born too late for yeah. a lot of reasons, for Madonna and for Kate Bush. But if I could go back in time, I would, for sure see Kate Bush's first tour where they innovated the headset microphone, which was called the tour of life in 1979. And I would, that's number one. And number two is Blonde Ambition tour, Madonna, this tour, which I, I'm just so lucky that I even saw it live like you did on HBO. Right. That's mind blowing. Via but, satellite. Um, right, via satellite. So technical. <laughs> that was so impressive at the time too. That was fancy. Yeah. Oh, yeah, well, if you were watching it live, like, that was some shit. Right. Oh, and, and her monologue in it where she talks about, um, I don't know if you, I don't know if you remember, you haven't gone back to watch that specific show, which is not in Truth or Dare. The one in Truth or Dare is a different show. Um, mm -hmm. So in Truth or Dare, the concert footage is from Paris, but the one from HBO was from Nice, France. Um, right. And she did this awesome monologue. It was really topical. And she talked even about Trump. And she she was like, she was like, oh, uh, why don't uh, why don't you spend your time worrying about important things, being sarcastic, like whether yeah. Ivana is going to take the Trump for all he all he has, because you right. know Ivana yeah. and Trump were in the midst of their divorce or whatever. And then she she uh, talks about how Roseanne Barr grabbed her crotch and she said, Roseanne Barr, baby, thumbs up. Uh, I know you were paying tribute to me. So it was like such a magical thing at the time and. Um, and we, we got to talk about Nikki and Donna, her sidekicks oh that are, are so incredible. It's like a girl group. It's like, and it, they're so, they're so funny and they're so smart and they're so talented and they're such characters. They have so much personality and you never see that alongside of pop stars now that, that they, um, again, it speaks to Madonna's great eye to, to find these people, right? Because Madonna herself cast this tour through big open calls and stuff, but, yeah. um, Donna and Nikki, this was kind of the start of them being part of the show and having a, a lot more um, just uh, awareness, like with the fans and everything. Everybody has backup singers and backup dancers, you know, pop stars. But there is not an example that I can think of other than Nikki and Donna where I knew who the backup dancers were by name and like by person. At, like they were. Right not her equals, but they were her equals. Part of the show. Equanimity. And they were right. such a part of Madonna's um, tours and, and videos and, and vocals for right. what? Better part of uh, maybe two decades or a decade no. and a half? 
the fans love them so like the fans love them as much as Madonna almost. It was yeah. like it's so awesome. And they're so great in Truth or Dare. And um, so she has Gabriel kiss Slam. Um, and when they kiss, um, it ends up in the final film. And <laughs> they actually, he actually sued her to try to block it. He didn't want it in there because at the time it was really scary to be gay. And like, it was something that you felt like I want to be in charge of the moment when I'm fully out to the world. It's not like it is now where you're chicken shit if you're not out. It's and like it's um, kind of AIDS epidemic too. Like right, it was very scary. Like in. people weren't hiring people because they were gay because of fear of AIDS. You you could risk not getting dance jobs. You could risk a lot of things. So yes, after this documentary, um, which Madonna called a home movie at the time of filming and then released it with without getting a lot of um i sent you the article from pedro yeah. Alm almodovar who yeah. is the, the famous spanish director um artiste and he uh revealed recently that madonna um basically came in with her big ego and then filmed them and he thought made them look like simpletons and didn't, he, she didn't get releases from anyone. And then later they're just like in the documentary. They had no yeah. clue they were gonna be in a theatrically released documentary. And he says in his recent article written during the, the quarantine for, from coronavirus, he said, um, uh, you know, if we had done that to Madonna, <laughs> she would have come with her lawyers right away and we would have been sued for not getting her permission and you know a uh, waiver a signed waiver for her appearance in the film to use to use her appearance um she did not do that with them or alec kashishian the director of truth or dare whoever you want to blame but um so there was a lot of fallout and outrage at the time around this documentary because um Either she wasn't clear that she was going to make it a film or she knew and she just withheld that from people. Yeah. But she wasn't on the up and up. Maybe she didn't even know fully that they were they would be able to make a documentary. Maybe she was just seeing what she could get. Yeah. But I think she really did downplay what that it was just home movies. I mean... Yeah. She um, tells on the bar that this is just um, a keepsake for the tour. Basically. Meanwhile... Yeah, she's hitting aggressively on, at the time, married Antonio Banderas and, right. you know, sh shunning his wife. We, um, and we talked about uh, Clockwork Orange uh, being inspiring the tour. Another film that inspired this tour and the Express Yourself music video, which cost $10 million to make, is the German expressionist film from 1927, Metropolis, directed mm -hmm. by Fritz Lang probably one of my favorite directors of all time if not my favorite and it's because of metropolis and how incredible that film is and the monocle that she wears is it's it's like all straight out of the aesthetic of that film the stairs that she ascends um the gears the giant gears and yeah. at the start of the show it's all straight from metropolis of course um you know with her own spin of female empowerment so she's like taking it and flipping it and being like the female boss, like at the head of this billion dollar company. And she's coming down with her power suit, with her like tits sticking out of it, with her comb bra, with like the slits. It's like, it's so fucking incredible on so many levels. It um, is. That the song way, is The way she appropriates the pop culture like this, oh, yeah. but then makes it relevant in a new and interesting and different way, not just ripping it off. Um, you know, it's it's brilliant and awesome. Yeah, she. I mean, she takes her references, I think, and she clearly adds Madonna to it, but she, she elevates a lot of her references. And, you know, it, that, again, much like Like a Prayer, if you had never seen the music video to express yourself, that that, that song is a fucking anthem. And um, but right. that video is absolutely incredible. And the Gautier power suit with the slits, such right. as the peeks out and then that moment where she she takes off the jacket and you see like the full corset and bustier yes <laughs> and and um who directed that music video um just you know a little indie guy by the name of david fincher david fucking fincher of course who went on to do fight club and all kinds of iconic cinema 
in his own right, influential cinema. So, um, yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, Madonna was, was just, um, and just did like Dick Tracy, um, her role as Breathless Mahoney and Dick Tracy right before this tour as well as Like a Prayer. So you have this blonde bombshell mixing with this Catholic schoolgirl of Like a Prayer. And what's so awesome too about the Blonde Ambition Tour is she had like just the right amount of like material to pick from to create this like Broadway show experience where she could have like a narrative and an arc, but also have like hit after hit after hit. Like every single song was a hit pretty much with the only exception being the Dick Tracy segment where she's introducing some of the new songs, which I think are great songs, but like it was just such such a great moment in her career because after this, you know, you get you get so far along where it's almost like which which do you pick to like tell right. something really powerful because almost you have too big of a, a catalog in some ways. Right. Or you before this, like, where there's almost like too small of a catalog. This is like that sweet spot. Yeah. No, I agreed. And I it's it's interesting because you know we're we're talking we're moving into strike a pose, but you know. I watched Strike a Pose a couple months ago, and then you know that 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 movie breaks your heart because these these men that were the dancers on this one of her arguably most famous tours of all time, who in Truth or Dare are showcased as being she's so close with them, and then Strike a Pose really forces you to question like were they being exploited and used? Right. Before? going back and watching Truth or Dare last night and you hear Madonna, you know, say, I love having children to watch over. Yeah. Um, I started to feel like a mother to the ones, uh, to, excuse me, to my dancers. Um, yes. And, you know, it, she didn't have a mother growing up and, and she very much is a mother to them, but she's also very right. sexual, intimate with them. So you have that dynamic, but she's also as is, uh, in my opinion, elucidated in Strike a Pose, she's very much the toxic mother because yeah. it, it is revealed that she did not have their best intention, uh, you know, their best um, uh, interest, rather, at heart. Right. It's This gets into a complicated and a deep area, which I'm here for. So, so, so I mean, we don't have to go down a rabbit hole. No, I just, and I, I love it. Let's go down the rabbit hole. I just, um, it was interesting to come full right. circle and well, watch it again. people go, go down this rabbit hole. And I think we, you should if you want to get to a deeper understanding. But Madonna lives in a certain mindset where in order, in her opinion, to maintain a sense of relevance, you have to swap out all the people around you for mm-hmm. the latest and greatest trendsetters. And she did that in the 90s when she started doing the electronica stuff in Ray of Light. She started working with the brilliant William Orbit, um, who was an electronic mastermind and who she hadn't really worked with before, except on one remix. And, um, you know, so then when you do the tour, do you do it with all the same dancers or do you do you get the more cutting edge, like younger people? I mean, you start. For a while, she had like a troop there, but then I don't think they were prepared for um, how quickly she swapped some of that out in right. order, I guess, to, to remain relevant, which is kind of cold. Um, I was friends with a woman um, who uh, knew Madonna in person in the 70s um, named Andine. And she had Madonna in her classroom. Uh, She was a teacher. She had Madonna in her classroom. When Madonna graduated high school, she remained friends with Madonna while she was in college at the University of Michigan. She moved up to Canada where Madonna came up to visit her a few times. They wrote Mm -hmm. notes back and forth, which I saw. And then as soon as Madonna like hit it big, that friendship was like cut off. And this one woman, Andine, was really heartbroken, and uh, she's passed away of cancer now. But um, I knew her in L.A., um, you know, up until her death, and it forced me to question a lot of, like, why, okay, someone like you and I, normal people, when we form that bond, we want to keep that person for the long term in our life, or at least try to. Right. We don't just move on. And someone like Madonna, we've seen again and again where she moves on. 
Um, so when she doesn't really have a lot of people around her that were there kind of from the beginning. And mm-hmm. I think if she wants to keep her own mind like completely fresh and cleared out. And she right. never meditates on the past, hardly ever. I mean, you see it here and there, it's very few. She doesn't, that's why a lot of these tours haven't been released properly and restored. And um, because she's always like about her next album, her next tour. Right. And um, I think it's, it's weird and strange now because you're seeing her not be on the radio and not get picked up, even though she's trying, she's working on these songs like Ghost Town, which um, with people who are quote unquote hit makers, she's working with like Diplo and all these people, but she can't get on the radio. She's clearly trying. And I don't know if, if, if she's bitter about that or doesn't care or whatever, but she's always like in that mindset. And she never shifted gears as she got older into any kind of other mindset. Um, mm. So I think there's there's a lot there's a lot happening there psychologically. And we talked about her, her the death of her mother when she was five and that being like her ultimate abandonment, right? And we see in Truth or Dare when she goes to her grave and people said, how can you take cameras to your mother's grave? I didn't find that offensive, but um, she does uh-huh. have this extreme bond to her mother, almost like an obsessive bond. And I think that's how she relates to Catholicism is through her mother um, uh-huh. who she remembers, but lost when she was only five. Yeah. And I think she felt extremely abandoned by that. And I think that carries through um, to some of these relationships that she doesn't keep around. I think the more some of the more high profile or famous or influential people kind of stick around a little bit longer. Right. But the people that aren't independently famous and super successful and, and uber ambitious in this way that she is, um, she almost just doesn't have the bandwidth for. Right. It's it's interesting and I went down the rabbit hole, so there we go. No, I, I think there's a couple things going on there. I mean, even if you take the uh, the level of fame that she exists at out of the equation, anyone that loses their mother at age five, that's gonna be with you're gonna carry that load, right? That's gonna inform who you are. Definitely for the rest of your life. Number one. Number two, you add to the fact that in my personal opinion, but also this is a true fact, um, she is an artist with like a capital A, true sense of the word. She has said many, many times, I wanted to be an actor. Um, it just ha- so happened that pop music and dance happened first. Like she wanted, she's a performer, performer. Right. Um, an artist, right? You, when you have an artist, especially at, at that caliber, who's also highly performative, they're operating at a different frequency already. And then number three, you add into this equation, like this Michael Jackson deity level of fame. Right. Operating on another fucking plane, right? Must be difficult to deal with people that just have very ordinary existences, like relating to them and like keeping those, keeping that going, yeah. If you are committed to your but also sacrificing things and people to quote unquote stay relevant and at the top. So, That's so maybe the, the fame and the relevance and um, perpetuating it tends to become more important than humanity of these real people in her life. Yeah, I think it, it it's almost a necessity. I mean, she's not the only famous person where you see the same pattern of behavior of discarding people who were uh, for a moment in time extremely important to you vital necessary right. people you know even her family members but you know th- it begs the question like is it is that almost a necessity in order to survive on that plane of existence right. you know can you, right. can you maintain relevance throughout six decades at a high caliber <laughs> of, of, of performance and talent and keep delivering and also still maintain um, long-term- A with your teacher from the 70s. <laughs> right, and, and it's right. so, I, yeah. I'm, I'm, it's such a sad story and, and I'm, I'm happy that you shared it, but I mean, it's it breaks your heart and this is what Strike a Pose really like, it elucidates, right. like people be, were disposable yeah. for, 
Simultaneously- yeah, and it's not. I love. I love the point you just made that it's not only about Madonna. What the point you're making? You're making it about that level of fame, right? So probably a lot of individuals that are operating on that level. This is like the mo. Yeah, and I'm not suggesting that this also just wasn't part of her personality too. I think it's a bit, right. But you know, if if you are. It's a, it's a little bit of a paradox because I think she really does love people and care about these friendships and these, even her family members. But yeah. I also think at the same time, they're disposable or need to be disposable. I think it's both and. It's and like, that's maybe really there's like to. a fame addiction too. That's oh, a little sure. bit where, where um, oh, Jackson had it. it's like when alcohol becomes the, the, the thing you put above your family because or or a drug addiction you're you put that above your relationships with other people and it destroys them because it's something you're fueling that is a little bit destructive and i think fame can be that same way yeah i mean michael jackson is was a fame whore he was a slave to the you know to his agile his adulation um and and madonna even in truth or dare though you really do see her she's a bit of not a she's a bully i mean there's a couple instances right. i noted where, like you know first of all she throws a lot of shade like she throws some shade at oprah <laughs> she throws yeah. a lot of shade at Janet jackson and it's probably Let's like into it. yes like you know well, she calls right. she calls jaja gabor a pig in french she calls her a cochon. Yes, a cochon and you know when she's trying on clothes at chanel and her dancers are in the dressing room with her one of them, I forget who it is. It might have been Louise. He says, "You look, it looks a little Janet Jackson rhythm nation." And she says, "Yeah, oh, bite your tongue." You know, that's that's Jose Extravaganza says that's that, and he he, you know, he came from the house of Extravaganza. That's why it's Extravaganza. But right. that's but, New York underground Vogue ball scene. But yeah, so mm-hmm. when 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 they're saying Janet Jackson, it's because they're they're realizing there that she's not you know working Metropolis into her show. She's right. not a more of a highbrow like cutting edge. She's not going to the the pulling from the the gay scene, which then was like taboo. Like you don't you don't be gay. It, it wasn't cool then. Um, Madonna's like, no, I'm gonna hold this gay culture up. Yeah. Um, Janet wasn't doing anything like that. So in, in that sense, like they, they were very different, but yeah. and I love Janet Jackson anyway, um, no, for, I, I her own, for her own thing that she was doing, but, um, yeah, it's, it's so funny. And then there's another moment where Madonna says, um, oh, Chicago, they won't let me, they, we have to go on early here with our show, which is another reason to not want to live in Chicago, despite the fact that Oprah Winfrey lives here. I'm paraphrasing. I'm not going to get the, the wording right for whatever reason. Yeah. But I, was like, I know this movie by heart, actually. But um, yeah, so she says, you know, a reason to not want to live in Chicago is that Oprah Winfrey lives there. Yeah, which is I'm brutal. Curious. That's brutal. Oh. Like, I'm wondering, though, like, what she had against Oprah, but it's... I think she just wasn't cool. Like, she just wasn't cool, especially at that time. Oprah's That's very true. cool now. That's at true. that time, Oprah was the top, top show host, way more soap opera-y topics right. of incest and this and that, like, scandal topics. It wasn't, like, intellectual Oprah that we love and have now as much. So it was Oprah definitely was a different cool. Oprah. Yeah. But, like... It's just interesting how the Madonna was very aware that people were beneath her, in her opinion, and wasn't afraid to say it. Um, no. What, what's great is as the 90s progressed, Madonna um, acknowledged all of this and said she became more spiritual through Kabbalah. And she had the birth of her daughter, uh, Lourdes, and said that um, she regrets not treating people better and that she had, you know, made the commitment to treat people better Um you know, more and more throughout the 90s, by the mid 90s, I'm sure was a completely changed person, as we all do as we grow up. Um, I think Madonna was like growing up later, because we talked about how she was in her early 30s at this this um, time period of blonde ambition. But, um, you know, and by 40, uh, with Ray of Light in her in her early from 40 on, was really t- a totally different person. And now we almost see a regression back I, yeah, way, that's really well. Which is yeah. so strange. Um, yeah. But 
it, it is. Um, you, I think you were telling me maybe off camera that Strike a Pose was kind of heartbreaking, and it is. And um, the the documentary about the dancers, the follow up of where they are now, it's so great to see these individuals and just to see how life has taken them all different ways. One of them totally into addiction in Las Vegas um, became, you know this or that another one um kevin went on to have a really successful career and dance with like lady gaga and shakira and like everyone under the sun and is still doing his thing um it's funny the people who worked on this tour that lady gaga then hired <laughs> like right. all of them like yeah. kevin stay she danced with mama makeup remember the scene mama makeup's here oh um, yeah that woman that the, the um, Sharon Galt, her name is, um, known as Mama Makeup in Bond Ambition Tour, Truth or Dare. But she actually went on to do Gaga's hair and makeup. So she oh, did nice. the ponytail for Madonna in this tour. Right. Um, she call. did the hair bow for Gaga later, the bow hair, yeah. the bow made out of hair with the platinum um, for Gaga later. So it's interesting. And then Gaga scoffs at the comparisons. Come on. But. Yeah, well, okay. Let's. <laughs> Let's all be honest with ourselves. Lady Gaga is a reductionist bitch. She's highly talented as a songwriter, but like her performative whole thing, I'm not here for. But I, I'm glad you brought up Mama Makeup because that was another example that I had in my notes of like Madonna sure. being a bully because Madonna says to her right. like when she's getting her hair done, like I used to be up on girls like you, and it's saying it with a smile. Can you believe the honesty? <laughs> hey, calm down. Calm I down. Know. Take a seat. No. Like, but yeah, we're here for it. It's it's so um it's so fascinating, right? Like it's it it's you you can't tear your eyes away from truth or dare. You can't, and it's it, you know going back to like how you know who Madonna is or was at that point, and how she was so um nonchalant about tossing these dancers away, which you really see mm. in Strike a Pose, where right. Most of them are not living great lives. And right. And I think there was the um to be to tell all sides of the story, there was a lawsuit from some of the dancers brought against Madonna for using them without full extent of permission. She had permission to film them, but I don't I think that they didn't the, know the context. The trick were exactly was that they didn't realize it would be a theatrical release. So that is like a separate contract, right? You would think. And they didn't have that with her. So they were very upset that um, about three of them banded together and sued her. And um, then they had to meet for arbitration. And they said that she was like, like, bitch, you're dead to me. In that, in that meeting where they were in an office and her and her lawyers and them and their, the, their lawyers. So I think that was like a big part of it too. Yeah. But you do see this this theme, unfortunately, of moving on from people. She even had this like incredible friendship after after this Truth or Dare era. She had this great. Uh, she did the film A League of Their Own, and she met Rosie O'Donnell on the set of that film and struck up this iconic friendship. They were BFFs. Oh, Ro, Ro and Mo, and then uh, Rosie had a talk show, and Madonna would go on the talk show, and they would do Ro or Mo, and they would do little games, and it was just like. Madonna, Nikki, and Donna, but it was Madonna and Rosie. So it was this other iconic friendship. And now you never hear of them like together. And and Rosie says she's still in contact, but you just get the sense it's just not that it's not that close friendship anymore. Right. It's what serves her in the moment, you know, for right. better. And again, not to suggest that it's not authentic and sincere for Madonna in that moment, but then when the moment passes, the other people are left out to dry and you know, in Truth or Dare, when you see the Warren Beatty kind of dynamic, and there's this great scene where they are interviewing Warren while she's getting ready. And, you know, he says, you know, she doesn't want to live off camera. Why right. even say something if it's not on camera? Do you even Which, exist if it's not on camera? And yes, I want to get into that. So I don't know how you feel about that, but I, I see that both ways because he... I think I think of him as naive and and way behind the times because this documentary now everyone lives on camera. Look at social media. So Madonna yeah. was like way ahead of the curve on all this and was actually genius by being on camera all the time. In a way, of course it's ego, but in a way it's like 
it's this is gonna be the future like daddy you're way like it was so naive in a way but also it was very poignant in that moment i think a lot of people connected to him in that moment and said ah oh, there's a lot of truth there so yeah. i i see it definitely both ways um but we, i i forgot to touch on how uh, prophetic this documentary is in terms of like this is before um mtv like the real world which was right. the first big reality show on MTV where they followed people around like this and, and kicked off reality TV as we know it today, which hopefully no one thinks is real because it's highly produced and scripted. But right. this was like this kind of the, the start of that in a way. But yeah. you can clearly see her addiction to attention. So he's also right. Yeah. And I, I just, I, the only other thing... Um, you know, I want to say about Truth or Dare, because I, I know we want to talk more about Striker Pose, is um, just this this kind of revelation I had last night about her, and I want to know what you think, but, you know, I, I think she's paradox, and I love paradoxes. I love that she is one, probably 100% authentic and sincere, but also, you know, yeah. a bit. She's and, an enigma, and, for sure. Yeah, and there's two things that, um, first of all, anybody that's 100% unapologetic about their behavior right. is fascinating. It's They're just inherently right. fascinating. And you know it commands parents? respect in a way, or at yes. least it commands your attention. But right. I wanted to ask if what, what you might think about this. You know, I, I'm a big, um, I'm fascinated by the difference between our identities and our roles, right? Like, Melissa with a capital M is, you know, not right. my job, is not my school, is not as a girlfriend or whatever. Like, those are my roles um, as a YouTuber. Um, but I look at somebody like Madonna or Michael Jackson, and it's like, and, and many other people, but it's, I think it's possible with people like that, that are artists through and through down to their, like, chromosomes, their identity is perform it, per, is performer. So mm -hmm. when they are performing, right. they're on stage or they're a celebrity, they're not, that's not like Madonna, her role as a, like that's Madonna. Madonna mm -hmm. is performance. Michael Jackson right. is performance. Now right. that's probably different now that she's a mother, of course, but for most of her career, I, 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 I believe like her identity was artist slash performer those weren't roles yeah. or who she is I don't know yeah yeah oh it's so interesting and we're probably going to do a movie hour on the anime perfect blue which explores this theme so fucking well and Madonna shows clips of the anime perfect blue in her tour drowned world in 2001 on the big screens so I think uh it's full circle but yeah. um What's interesting is you can also argue that like the more you film her, the less you know her. It's like this thing that unravels. It's this ultimate paradox because like you never really are in inside with her thoughts. You never have a single private moment with her. It's all, she's aware that she's being filmed in a way too. And sometimes she plays the camera, sometimes she's more natural. But a big criticism about her and her art over the years that I think is sometimes justified is that um, people keep saying, well, we never really see the vulnerable human side of Madonna. We never get feel like we're really getting a, a sense of who she is as a person. Um, we, we never really feel like we get close to her for some reason. And I think... Um, Yes and no, but um, definitely, I I think it's it's a fascinating topic. Like you, we could go down so many different rabbit holes. But I, sometimes I, I think, think the more you film something, the less you know it in a way. And she would always say like, "Oh, you you haven't seen anything. I've shown right. you so much, but you haven't seen anything." And I think that there was a whole person inside there too with her thoughts that that we didn't see too. But. Yeah, and I don't, I don't necessarily agree that you never see Madonna vulnerable. I, I think you do, and even in Truth or Dare, at the end where they're doing like this kind of montage of um, her, her, uh, her cohorts, like her dancers right. and her, you know, her, her team commenting on her. You know, they're right. pretty much all of them are saying, you know, 
she's starved for love. She's she's trying to provoke attention and affection from people. Um, and that just this is just the way that she goes about it. Um, right. Which, I mean, if, again, if you're that famous, I mean, what else are you going to do? You, you can't trust most people. Everyone around you is yes, ma'am. But even when she's not being filmed, I would imagine that she's so self-aware that she's always on, even when the camera right. is not. Um, well, so yeah, you're never going to get like more than a couple layers of onions off of her, you know, at right. any given time. I think people's criticism was that um, her bravado and confidence that she projected was so strong that it must have been like um, armor, right? That there was yeah. something there be beyond the artifice and that they felt they could never break through that and and get to like the heart of, of her, I don't know. But and I I'm think, sure I think she was confident too. I mean, that is her too. It's all her. And I, thank you. I, I think it's true. Like if you were around her and you cared about her on whatever level, you would feel like that. Like this is a facade so that she can protect, protect herself and keep herself at arm's length. But also like, also no. Also like, you know, she is really maybe just that confident and that again that is who she really is and one of the first notes that I wrote like maybe 10 minutes into truth or dare was you know to your point like how much is how much of what she lets us see because she's you you mentioned you've only seen like a little bit right I'm showing you a lot but you've only so my one of my first notes was even within the context of this documentary is she a reliable narrator? And I would argue right. that she's not because it's a manufactured and produced right. version of herself. That she produced and edited. She was in the editing, on the editing floor. And I think she, I think um, Alec Kashishian, the director of this film, um, fought to, fought her on a lot of, a lot of scenes and won, which is great mm -hmm. because there was stuff she didn't want in there. She didn't want the thing about how Sean, was the love of her life she wanted to keep that out and and he won he's like no and also he said I'm I will glad direct that he did that because there you get a moment of vulnerability from right. her Absolutely. you can even see when she says it when they're playing truth or dare like she really doesn't want to be saying it right. out loud it's a great moment and I think people see glimpses like that and want more of it but yeah. I do also think it is all Madonna I mean um What's awesome is that when he first took the job to do this, like um, he was like blown away that she hired him because um, he had just done like music video type stuff and, but he sent it to her, but she saw like his eye and mm -hmm. um, he said, I will do this and I will do this good, but you have got to not restrict me. I've got to have full access and I've got to have some kind of partnership of creative control in presenting this. I'm not going to present you bad, but this, I'm, I'm going to do this right as a documentary. And so that I think the case. Him, right, the case. she's strong headed and he's strong headed. So I think, um, you know, they met in, in the middle and ho hopefully uh, he won a lot of those battles because then we get a more honest viewpoint. So he's kind of keeping her honest a little bit there. Yeah, I, I think, it, I mean, the way the movie reads to me, it seems like it was a, a decent compromise. I think you're getting, a, a, you're getting vulnerable moments and you're getting also like Madonna in control of her narrative. But, you know, it's at the end when they're playing Truth or Dare and, and, and she's talking to, I believe she's talking to Luis at this point. And she says, you know, I'd kill, I wouldn't hire, um, you know, she, she uses Bags. the word fat. So, yeah. yeah. Um, she says, you know, I wouldn't hire fags that hate women. I wouldn't hire anybody that hates women. I would kill anyone that hates women. Um, I would kill anyone that, would hates kill that hates because I hate people that I hate. hate. People that hate. <laughs> and I just, that. That's such I, a great cyclical um, statement. <laughs> it is. And, it, and it's, I, I remember having heard it, but I had forgotten it. And then re-watching it it's just such a reminder to me that for all of her flaws if you want to call them that um i think at the end of the day throughout her career she's always been an advocate even if she doesn't yes. live it if even if she doesn't always walk the talk she's always an advocate for a higher good 
Yes, that's so true. And what a, a difference she single-handedly had in the gay movement at that time. She was the only fucking artist that was holding gay up as so good. Um, yeah. She put put gay men on pedestals. She put she shone spotlights on them. Yes, she didn't invent voguing, but she had the eye to to recognize how great it was as this gay art form and and bring it right and and she hired people like jose and lewis who you just mentioned from that scene from mm -hmm. the underground they were og voguers like they're right. the real deal so she brought them into the fold so she didn't like hire dancers that weren't the real deal and copy what the real deal people were doing some of those people were the real like voters from that ballroom scene yeah. it, that you see in paris is burning and some of these other documentaries but um and, the and show you, get pose. These, you get to see them in strike a pose like voting right. and, 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 in yeah. the, and in the tv show pose from fx um uh, Ho jose actually makes a cameo in that show does he um, okay yeah That's he awesome. does and you know he was there in real life and uh so it's so cool that she had such great taste with that kind of stuff but also that she lifted it up and she didn't it wasn't like uh i don't know how to explain it other than Whenever she pre hired gay people or celebrated gay culture, it was never done in jest and it was never done like looking down on it. It was always like holding it up. And that was so unprecedented at that time. No one else was doing that. And not to mention she would go to like all night dance-a-thons to raise money for, for AIDS that, that were not like um, televised or anything. She was just right. really doing it because she had some best friends in New York City in the early 80s that were gay that died of AIDS. And mm -hmm. um, her her original ballet teacher, Christopher Flynn, died of AIDS. And her good friend Martin mm -hmm. um, from New York City, who was not famous, but was a good sure. close friend of hers, died of, of AIDS and some other people. So she has donated millions of dollars to, to um, AIDS, but also to raising awareness for safe sex. So in the Blonde Ambition tour, she says, hey, you, don't be silly, put a rubber on your willy. So she's saying, yes, don't stop having sex, like be sexually free, but be smart and be safe, protect yourself. And that is like, was such an incredible message where other people were, were there was so much disinformation and so much um, confusion at that time. And, and shame. In shame, and people didn't understand gay culture or gay people or AIDS, or they thought gay people were predators, or they thought that they didn't, or they thought you could catch AIDS through handshakes and um, sharing drinks and stuff. Of course, none of which is true. And, and here, Madonna yes, was yes, never yes. afraid of AIDS, or or um, and she always celebrated gay culture. And she's really the only pop star that did. So like everybody, take a seat right yeah. now. Yeah, like, Lady Gaga takes several that. seats because. <laughs> you would not have your gay fan base if Madonna hadn't set the precedent. And it, it, to me, it, it begs the question about Madonna as a person right. and as a persona, which is that, um, you know, these gay men and one straight guy, allegedly, um, that were the backup dancers. I'm not, still not yeah, convinced. Oliver. Um, Oliver. Um, from the blonde ambition tour that are showcased in strike a pose. Mm -hmm. Um, that you see who have, for lack of a better word, been discarded by her. Um, uh, on the individual level, yes, like those people were tossed away. Um, right. But what she did for that community right. as a whole, like does that, does that outweigh, like what well, she did, also, yeah. does that outweigh discarding That's an interesting point. Well, if you were to ask her, I have a hunch that she might say that, I think she kind of views it as that she really gave those people a comeuppance. Like she yeah. was like, here, I'm gonna raise you up on the national stage. Now, now it's up to you. So right. like after the tour's over, mama hired you, mama, mama gave you exposure. Mm -hmm. It's now, now, and a lot of these people did try follow up projects to success or, or failure. But I think she has, I've seen this multiple times with her, people she works with, and even with her and family members, um, where 
she is never that person that's like, I'm just going to support you while you're hurting yourself. I'm going to like mm -hmm. lift you up a little bit, but, but then it's tough love, right? Because it's up to you to make your life happen. And if Keep I'm up. always supporting you financially and right. you're going to lean back on the couch, it's, it's not good for you either, right? She had a brother that had um, a lot of addiction issues and at one point stopped helping him financially because she wanted to encourage him supposedly to get his shit together um, and that she wasn't just going to fuel that, right? So, like, there is a lot of tough love there. And that's, um, that is still love. Tough love is still love. So um, there's so many ways to look at it. I, I see it definitely both ways, but. Uh, yeah, same. Again, it's, it's not a, it's not black and white. Um, Just like everything in real life, life is so complex. And I think it's human nature to try to distill it down, make it black and white and make it super simple. Like, oh, Madonna's a, ma a manipulative bitch and she doesn't have that much talent, but she's got a lot of street smarts and blah, 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 all that bullshit that's just perpetuated and said over and over and over again that doesn't get to the heart of any kind of real truth. But Agreed. I mean, like I said, it, it, specifics aren't super fresh in my mind. The overall tone of it just being kind of heartbreaking for me personally to like know that right. these people don't have any connection or anymore. I think you should you, say whatever else you want to say. Do you think about. some of these people, this is like devil's advocate and it's maybe harsh, but do you think some of them, they let themselves down too because yeah. they either spiraled into um, resting on their laurels or drug addiction. And it's just kind of like, you wish that Madonna could have like stopped everything and really helped them on that personal level. But there was yeah. no way she could really do that. But again, yeah, it's it's everyone has to have personal accountability, right? Um, so yeah, there certainly they were responsible for the decisions they made after this uh, tour. Um, but she should also be held accountable for maybe being a little bit, um, you know, disposing of people carelessly. But then you look at it like, well, was it ever really her responsibility to be BFFs with everybody forever and hold their hands and be their mommies? So there's right. all of these questions, but I would also say that, you know, you have I think these kids that she oh. pulled out of obscurity and a lot of them out of bad circumstances. And then all of a sudden right. they're on tour traveling the world with the most Without, famous person on the planet. Yes. And then that Without in itself is a high. Yeah, but that's also a high and a drug, and then you come off of that, and then all of a sudden you're back exactly where you were before. Right. That's gonna that's gonna mess you up. A well, lot I think it. it's interesting that people like Carlton and um, Kevin and maybe some of the others went on to continue to be in commercials and productions and even work with her. Uh, again, Carlton was on the Girly Show tour after after this tour. Um, so she brought him back for her next yeah. tour. Um, Nikki and Donna have worked with her on and off and now do not work with, haven't worked with her in a long time. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, it's just, it's, it, it's interesting because some of them have had pretty good lives after this based on, hey, I, I'm a Madonna dancer. So right. it gets you in the door with other auditions and stuff like that. Um, or you can just use it to hang out at the club and get right. free bottle service because you're a Madonna, you were a big Madonna dancer right. and then you're not really doing anything. But I think you, you really hit on something when you said that she plucked them from obscurity because she really did. And some of them did not have this, the skill set that she was already well developed in of dealing with fame, right. dealing with finances, dealing with, um, life life goals and ambition yeah. and and all those things and um you know we're really from the underground gay dance scene and stuff and i think some of the most heartbreaking stuff is with jose extravaganza with his mom where he's oh, with her in 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 their small apartment and yeah. um, just the way that she says i i had all these great hopes for him and he was gonna buy me a house and they both start crying and um it's powerful to see and um, you want yeah. you want the best things for these people because they were super talented and um, mm -hmm. 
Yeah, but I think it's, it's tough to see that some of those moments for sure. Yeah, I think, um, and thank you for making me watch Strike a Pose. Um, I, I think if you're, whomever your biggest hero or fan is, you know, they say never meet your heroes for this very reason, right? Like if you really met them. I would, would be so scared to, and to meet I would, Yeah. Oh, I would too. I mean, talk about intimidating, but like, at the, the point I want to make is like strike a pose is is if you're a Madonna fan or you've ever deified her like myself um watching strike a pose is so necessary because it really humanizes her and really reframes how you view celebrity and how you view somebody that has informed your life that you respect right. and that you're in awe of um and it's just it's just so good to watch both of these um, back to back. It's 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 fascinating. So thank right. you and for that, that level of fame. That, that level of fame that was like a vortex tornado that sucked these people up with it, and yeah. then when it when it died down, you know, spread them out and left them and dissipated, is kind of like what happened with this mm -hmm. whirlwind of a tour. Yeah, I mean, the tornado analogy is spot on because that's exactly what it was. Like, she, she's the tornado. She's this tour de force. Her, her and her fame, right. Yeah, and it sucks you in. And then at the end, when everything's over with, you're strewn about. Left right, to and when you're with her, you're going from, like, um, the, the hottest people, the hottest French artists and Spanish artists and directors and uh, fashion houses and... God, I mean, you're just like living on the top of the world. Like you're, it doesn't get any higher when no. you're on that roller coaster. And then when it ends, it, it ends, you know? Yeah, and how, how do you cope with that, you know? With, but I think that, that? <laughs> it's, so, it's so fascinating to get to know them more as people yeah. through this documentary rather than, um, especially because they're totally different people because it's so much, so, so much removed from, who they were as as young people in Truth or Dare, um, to yeah. to who they are now as more, like more thoughtful, realized people in this documentary, but um, it's just great to see them and um, and they and uh, they deserve to have been showcased with this documentary as as heartbreaking as it can be in my opinion, you know these are people that you know blonde ambition as we know it would not exist if it weren't for these men. And right. it's it, it I'm very happy that somebody made this documentary to give them an opportunity to tell their story um, because, you know, they are great artists in and of themselves. You know what I mean? And For they sure. should to speak their truth outside of, you know, her shadow. And right. that's what in my opinion. So, yeah, I'm so glad you suggested that we do this movie hour because, I mean, it. It's, you know, it's fun and whatever. It's Madonna, it's a documentary and another documentary and music and pop. But it's really like, you can really go down like a, a great rabbit hole about like yeah. the philosophy of celebrity and and just, um, yeah, I, I just think, I implore yeah. everybody to watch these two documentaries back to back. Yeah, it's a lot to think about and it does uh, beg for rabbit holes left and right which is great I love content we love content that does that right but um it's funny how many people just took truth or dare like at total face value and really like I said I think it's human nature to simplify it and yeah. which is a shame because there's such beauty in the complexity that is reality and Name. um you know and I think we'll we'll never truly know or be 100% accurate um because everything is filtered through our own individual. But I've tried to look at this. This topic is so fascinating to me and um, that I've tried to, to hear it out for what it is through through anything I can, through yeah. any kind of, um, you know, meeting these people when at the premiere of this at Strike a Pose during Outfest in, in Los Angeles and getting to talk to them and just... And, See, see all the interviews that they did surrounding that project. They did a lot of interviews. And uh, it's just fascinating to me, like dance at that time and dance culture. And I mentioned the show Pose on FX, just the, the culture of the underground um, ballroom scene in, in mm -hmm. New York City. And um, the fact that Madonna, like no one knew that was going on at the time. Right. And then Madonna like somehow was, was, was such an insider to all these 
like trends that, that had not yet even been emerging. And, and then we're only emerging because of her. And she, she like solely responsible for bringing voguing to yeah. the mainstream, um, yeah. which somehow people twist and then say, oh, well, she just like used voguing and it wasn't it. hers. And she just appropriated it. That I is disagree. Such, that's such a bullshit argument because like we wouldn't all have had that cultural moment with with voguing and with with gay men and gay culture and i think people experiencing gay culture who who'd never even experienced it at all through the film truth or dare um and through that tour and stuff and um like kudos for that i mean I don't know how anyone could see it otherwise. It blows my mind, but yeah, I mean, I think Vogue, Vogue is a great thing, and it's the great thing she did with it. And she is a great dancer. I think like her her style of dance lends itself really well to Vogue and posing because mm -hmm. she's such a um, like a person that plays to the camera and is good at posing and is good at angles and is yeah. um, presentational. And she she had already had that style in a way, so it's like a match made in heaven. So, like, even if voguing didn't originate, you know, from Madonna, which is, like, a ridiculous, like, argument to make in a negative right. way, yeah. um, it was so, like, it, it, fit, it, it fit her so well, you know what I mean? Right. And uh, it was just, like, such a convergence of these amazing things happening culturally at dare the time. I say, dare I say a, a zenith moment? <laughs> it was. I having think... a zenith moment. Um, in this tour... There's, there's two hairstyles, two main hairstyles. So for, for she starts off in Japan and she goes from Asia to North America. That's how the, the tour goes. And for Asia and North America, she has a ponytail, like a la I Dream of Jeannie. And then when she gets to Europe, she has the curls. Fans have researched this and we think We've heard that like the, the ponytail was like pulling her hair too much and it was like mm -hmm. pulling it out, but also it would get caught in her headset microphone when she would do her, her spins. Yeah. But, yeah. Right. But it was her, it was her vision for the tour was the ponytail. So, but some fans prefer the curls, which is this more like this t-shirt design. So what's, what's your favorite in the, the ever ongoing debate ponytail versus curls? Where do you lie on this? Because in True There Dare, you can see both ponytail. hairstyles, but they never address it. Ponytail. Amen, girl. Yes. yes. Ponytail. Me too. Ponytail for me is like quintessential blonde ambition, whereas right. the more Marilyn Monroe curls is like, like slightly after. Like, I right. don't know. Like, I'm, I, yes. I want bra and I want a high and tight pony. Yes, high and tight pony. When, like when she's dissing Kevin Costner, she is backstage with the pony. And it's tight. Like, and it's tight and right. Yes. And it's bitchy. And the curls aren't bitchy. The curls are more glam. Like the high and tight right. pony says, don't fucks with me. Yes, with the eyebrows. Yes. <laughs> it's so on point and it's so like, um, it's so iconic, right? The ponytail is more of an iconic look because it's more high style. Like it's more stylized and like fantasy in a way, whereas and it's curls, not it's not directly referencing Marilyn Monroe, which I feel like her curls are more of a direct, obvious reference to somebody else. Maybe a mix of like Marilyn Monroe and Shirley Temple or something. Yeah, because okay. Shirley Temple okay. had the ringlets that were like really tightly curled. Yeah, and I remember when HBO premiered this, they said. Once upon a time, there was a girl with a curl. <laughs> when she was good, she was very good. When she was bad, she was amazing or something like that. And it was like, that. yeah, that was their teaser for it. A girl That's with a curl. I'll find it on YouTube and send it to you if I can. Okay. But I wanted to talk to you about the live band sound because mm -hmm. this doesn't sound like they're playing a track on this tour because they actually had like real drummers, real percussion, like the drum percussion that sounds more like a live band sound. Of course they had synthesizers, but the sound was really enriched live. Like when she's doing Into the Groove and stuff and even Vogue, you hear like bongos and stuff, which you don't hear on the, 
album tracks or whatever, but the band was like really tight. And I just wanted to know if you kind of noticed that. Well, you are an actual musician, so your ear is much more uh, developed than mine. I, I could tell that even when I watched it way back then, it sounded very much like there was a live band. And now knowing like how far removed we are from all of that with everything being overdubbed and backing tracks, like you can really appreciate like the sound, but I don't right. know if my ear is as a, like sophisticated enough to discern like if it was a recording that was very like right. band versus like an actual live band but it absolutely like the sound doesn't sound like anything you would hear now with a pop star on no, stage it's no, just not at all yeah not at all and like if you're like me and you're obsessed with her and you know that the studio tracks like the back of your hand and you know all the layers and the instruments the percussion is very different on blonde ambition I wouldn't say very different, but it's it's clearly different. It's more of like a live sound. Like you have bongos and stuff that you, you wouldn't normally hear, like on her yeah. album recordings, which are more synth based. Even the drums are more like automated drum sounds on some of the albums. Okay. Whereas in in the on the tour, they're actually playing the drums um, live, not by keyboard, but by actual drums. Mm -hmm. And just the band is incredible. Um, but yeah, I wanted to take us through the people on this tour, specifically the two backup singers, and then all of the dancers who are immortalized in the newer documentary, Strike a Pose, because I'm such a fan of all of them. I think they're all such great and talented and beautiful artists and people. And I just wanted to show them the respect. So here we go. So Nikki Harris, um, she was born in Benton Harbor, Michigan, So, she, as well as Madonna was born in Bay City, Michigan. But then her family moved to Rochester Hills, where she went to high school, and that's kind of where she grew up. Her and Nikki had this connection because they were both from Michigan. Nikki was actually on the Who's That Girl tour along with Donna. So Nikki and okay. Donna were both on the Who's That Girl tour with Madonna in 1987, but they didn't, they weren't featured on that tour so you really had to like look to spot them they were like traditional backup singers where they were in the background and then of course on the next tour which was 1990s blonde ambition tour which truth or dare follows we see them brought to the for forefront you know as these characters and as these actors so nikki harris was born april 17th 1962 and was the daughter of grammy award nominated jazz artist Jean Harris. So it's she comes from like a great uh, musical family, as does Donna DeLore. Donna DeLore was the, the white counterpart of the backup singers. She was born September 10th, 1964 in Calabasas, California. She, her father was a uh, record producer, musician, Al DeLore. And um, so they both well, have they like both music kind of in their blood. Yeah, right. exactly. Crazy. And Madonna was really good at like spotting this talent and these people. And um, um, so this guy named Gardner Cole, who Donna DeLore was dating, wrote Open Your Heart, the Madonna song. Mm -hmm. so, so at the time, Madonna's management was looking for material for the True Blue album. And Gardner Cole submitted three songs, including Open Your Heart, Madonna's manager heard the song and thought it would be a hit for Madonna. So he asked Cole to re-record the song, but with a female voice so that they could kind of get, get it to Madonna sounding like more like what Madonna would make it sound like. Um, so right. Donna DeLore actually re-recorded that song and then it was submitted to Madonna's producer, Patrick Lennard, who was already kind of starting to work with Donna DeLore on the side because he liked her voice, he got to know her, and he started using her as his demo recording artist. So when he would fashion demos, he would have Donna DeLore um, record the vocals for them because she was a very consummate like studio vocal vocalist, basically. Mm -hmm. And they kind of started to discover that Donna DeLore sounded like Madonna. So she had the same timbre in the same range and the same kind of um, vocal stylings of Madonna. So then um, when Donna DeLore tried out 
for Madonna through her producer, Patrick Lennard for the Who's That Girl tour, um, Patrick kind of positioned her and Madonna and got everyone else off and said, Madonna, just listen to how your voice sounds here with Donna, uh, Madonna, Donna. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, and Donna's voice sounded really similar to Madonna, so she could like kind of layer her and then okay. like also fill in on, on parts for her and stuff like that. So it was like a nice layer with Madonna. Thanks. Their voices work so well together. And then Nikki, who um, brought like the soul, she was like a nice distinction, right? So her voice was very different from Madonna's, but she could do like the, the girl in like a prayer that's like, that's the choir. You know how in there's that more soul. Um, yeah, yeah more the added. soul, yeah. the the girl that goes crazy in like a prayer, like ah. And um, so they were like the perfect duo because one could like play off of them, and then Donna could like be there right there with her. So um, both of them were on the Who's That Girl tour, but yeah, they didn't become her sidekicks until Blonde Ambition. They they were consistently like in a lot of the key performances and videos, like the the Vogue video which they did in February of 1990 before the tour kicked off and the Vogue MTV VMA performance, which they did in 1990 after the tour wrapped. Um, iconic. Both, both like extremely iconic um, things, right? Donna worked with Madonna on more tours than Nikki. So something happened with Nikki and Madonna. Uh -oh. They had a falling out. So Nikki's last tour with Madonna was the first one I ever saw, which was Drown World Tour in 2001. Um, and Donna continued on after Drown World, whereas Nikki stopped. So Don, Donna ended up doing the Reinvention Tour in 2004 and the Confessions Tour, one of my all-time favorite ones, which I was front row for twice in a row in so Miami. Yeah. So jealous. Such a great tour, let me tell you. That uh, next to Blonde Ambition, that's probably like my favorite tour of her, the Confessions tour, like her last genius moment, in my opinion. But yes. um, so Donna was also there for that. And then that was it. Like after 2006, both of these people never worked with Madonna again. We talked about people coming in and out of Madonna's life. Um, so these two backup singers went on to work with her like into the 2000s, whereas the dancers did not. But um, Donna, a little bit more so. So something happened there with Nikki that they kind of both acknowledge that something happened. Both of, them, both of them have not only been like the Nikki and Donna show with Madonna, but they've also been on her albums, which sometimes is overlooked. So they have sang back up on like the Like a Prayer album, I'm Breathless, Erotica, Bedtime Stories, and even Ray of Light, they've appeared as like backup singers along with her. And of course, in various music videos and live performances. So she put them in her music videos and on the MTV Music Video Awards, Grammy Awards, the European Music Awards, a bunch of television yeah. show performances. Oh, MTV. Right. right. So they weren't only on this tour with her. They were like in all the videos and all that stuff. She was really making it like a whole thing with them. And Madonna, of course, was always front and center, but they were like, you know, they're they're really cute in a lot of her videos too. They um, were I they were iconic. There was like during right. that era, that decade or so, Blonde Ambition, um, in in uh, what followed, like there was it was like a triad. Like there was right. no Madonna out backing, like without Donna and Nikki, rather. Like they were. That was it. Like, that was a whole thing. Right. And there's so, something missing now because of that. Like, they're I not there. I think so. And a lot of fans think so. A lot of fans have wondered, like, what happened. And um, <clears throat> Donna DeLore has even said that she felt like she was back to now being a backup singer instead of just, like, a co-performer. She was relegated to yeah, a backup. Yeah, she was relegated back to being in the background. So... Um, she was kind of over that on the last tour, last couple of tours she did with Madonna and even said like, oh, you know, I'm with the band, but like you have me on a platform with a speaker and I can't hear myself. And Madonna's like, I don't know what to tell you. I mean, it really Madonna. became, I know. <laughs> so great. 
Madonna, what are you doing? I know. Madonna's like, you bitch, you, you've had enough. <laughs> like, it is not the Donna show, it's the Madonna show. <laughs> and whatever happened with Nikki, Madonna Very was not cool. having it because Nikki was kind of cut out of everything. Um, it's interesting to see them now because they're on social media and they're really great and I've met them and they're so nice. They were so gracious and um, they've done, like, they've reunited to sing together and stuff on on a single that they put out digitally and stuff. So definitely check that out if you can. Um, but I wanted to get into the dancers, which are the stars of the Strike a Pose documentary. The and dancers. also of blonde ambition there would yes. be no ambition as Definitely. we know it without these guys yes along with donna and nikki there were seven dancers um who are the dance troupe of blonde ambition and these are like really skilled dancers that um vincent patterson choreographed incredibly well for the show um they have a lot of strengths but um six are still alive one is passed away from complications due to AIDS. And um, three live in LA, two live in New York, and one in Las Vegas. Um, what's so great, and we need to pause and like give appreciation for, is that this tour ran the gamut of cultures and colors within the dance, within the dancers. You had Hispanic dancers, you had black dancers, Asian dancer, white dancer. Um, so you had the, the gamut, right? And that is great. She's presenting like a world in, encompassed, right? In these, just these dancers. And you you have such a good um, mix of styles between them from like those that are maybe more strong in like um, traditional like ballet and jazz, those that are more like the hardcore voguers that she pulled right from like the Ballroom. voguing scene. Ballroom, mm -hmm. yes. Oh, they're all giving me such life and I love it. And the way she presented them and exposed people to the difference in not only color, but um, sexuality, all these things and put and put it like, um, put people front row to it for, for True yes. Dare Dare. It's so incredible. You even see in True Dare Dare, um, a gay pride parade that they attend in New York City. That was groundbreaking at the time to show oh, that yeah. in, a, in a film, in a documentary with an artist mm -hmm. where other artists were concerned to even be associated with someone that was gay or had AIDS. Unapologetic. Right, Madonna never had any of those fears or hangups. Um, uh, she had a long history of, of gay friends and, and understood it, I think, pretty well, but yeah. just so, so well presented at that time. She made it exciting and fun, actually, to be gay. And she made me feel like yeah. so, so like proud of my of being myself as, as a gay man when I was so young and, and hadn't even really explored that yet. So, but she presented an image of it that was positive and you didn't have a lot of that in the culture. You had none. Of, she dis, she destigmatized it whilst, to your point, making it fun and exciting and in doing so, like, eliminated the fear right. around it and, and, the stigma. and that is yeah. people that have conversations. That's such a great point. There was that stigma, yeah. And she was having none of it. <laughs> <laughs> but she was just honestly, that's how she lived. And she was always surrounded by people of, of different um, backgrounds and cultures and sexuality. And that always interested her, which is so cool to me. So we'll, mm -hmm. we'll start with Louis Camacho. Um, he is really a real sassy gay, um, Hispanic <laughs> from New York and from that um, gay ballroom scene. And he and, uh, uh, he and Jose recorded a song in 93 after this tour. And so they cut a record called Queen's English that Madonna did backup vocals for to try to like help them out. And it was on no. the Sire, Sire Warner Brothers records. It's kind of like a deep house track, which is kind of fun and cool. So they tried to form like briefly, like basically a recording contract. It didn't yeah. quite work out, but they had their single and stuff, which was fun. Um, and then I'll do Jose next because he's kind of like a duo with Lewis, Jose mm -hmm. Gutierrez, 
Extravaganza because he's from the House of Extravaganza in New York City. He's one of the most widely recognized personalities to emerge from the New York City ballroom scene of the 80s. We talked about how he makes a, a cameo in Pose, the, yes. the FX series Pose, as he should. So Jose and Lewis, she basically was like, you guys are everything. And through, through, put them in the Vogue video, made them a part of the Vogue and everything choreography. Vincent Patterson doing the choreography, but them bringing a lot of flavor to it as well. I mean, they were real OG Voguers. Um, then you have Oliver Crumbs. Well, well, do you want to talk about how some of these people are in the in the movie? I don't know. In Strike a Pose, just stop me if you do. Oliver is yeah. the one that had kind of the. I don't. Know, do you call? Would you call it like a stroke or his part of his face like was a, paralyzed? Like a Bell's palsy, yeah. Right, and they talk about it in the film about how he he says something really cute like. Oh, it just happens to anyone. It just happens to you. And, then, and his wife is like, well, no, you don't just, it doesn't just happen or something. <laughs> There's like a funny moment in Strike a Pose with him and his wife. And he, he's the one straight dancer, Oliver Crum, Crumbs. And he, um, he is the one straight guy among all these gay dancers. And they say that he was so flamboyant when he showed up with like, his colors and his fashion and in strike a pose he takes us through like his sneaker collection and all yeah. that they they thought he was gay immediately and then of course he wasn't and um so he's the one straight dancer and then you yeah, have yeah I, 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 I take issue with that because not that straight men can't be flamboyant and can't love these things because <laughs> they can but like I'm not fully convinced that Mr. Crumbs is not gay. Like, really? just really? not fully convinced. But like, it's having possible. Watched I'll it, say it's possible. It's possible. Either oh, one is possible. I'm just, I'm just throwing out a question mark. But yeah. um, Louise. Well, when I saw, when I saw Truth or Dare when I was 11 or however old I was, yeah. I thought he was okay. He was maybe closeted. And he right. just didn't want to come out and all the other dancers were just more comfortable. But mm -hmm. now we, we find that he's married now and he's does act pretty straight. I mean, I don't know. But he was- Nor I. I'm just here to speculate. But right, I, I love but, I'm here for it. But Luis and, um, and um, Extravaganza, like yeah. they're, a, the two of them stand out personality wise in the documentary right. like yeah. they you they take up space in like a really good way like you can tell um and go having gone back and watched truth or dare after having watched strike a pose and getting to like to to take that full circle journey right like watch right. Dare whenever you saw it, then watch Strike a Pose and see where they are now, and then go back and watch Truth or Dare. It's like a whole different experience. But like to see Luis and um, Extravaganza, like they are fucking powerhouses of talent right. and personality. And they when, are. Especially when you watch the MTV movie uh, video award Vogue performance. Vogue, yes, 18th yeah. century. Let's say iconic for the 120 times. Marie Antoinette. The whole thing iconic, but like you. They're can all on that. All seven dancers and Donna and Nikki are in that. I think Luis and um, Extravaganza, like Jose, they, they stand out to me. Jose Lewis and the um, tall gentleman. I don't know if he's Latino. The German guy. Is he German? Okay. Slam so with the jaw. That guy with the jaw, like their movements are so, um, like, you know how when you watch any backup dancers, you know, there's always like some standouts, like it's right. those, but Luis and Extravaganza have all of the personality and you see that in Strike yeah. a Pose. Oh, I it's so great. And they, the Queen's English single that they did, they did it with producer Junior Vasquez, who ended up going on to be like one of Madonna's main remix producers which mm -hmm. is kind of interesting a lot of um madonna fans will know who that is but junior vasquez pretty cool guy um 
and we talked about Oliver. Um, we'll talk about we'll talk about uh, Salim Slam. He went by Slam. He's the one, the German looking guy. He had like long, wavy black hair. Yeah. He's the one in Express Yourself that Madonna gets like up close and personal with and she humps him. Yeah. And then like cuddles with him a little bit before she put, puts her um, monocle up to her eye during Express Yourself. He has like the wavy hair. He's also in her Express Yourself music video. She also spent some time with him during the Truth or Dare game at the end of Truth or Dare. Like, he's also in the bed with her. Yeah, and she says, you're gorgeous. I hate you. And she slaps him. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's yes. <the> guy. <laughs> yeah. So he was one of the, he was actually, he's the one that in Strike a Pose revealed that he had had HIV at the time and had never revealed that. So that came out in the newer Strike a Pose documentary that he was living with HIV at the time and hadn't told anyone. Mm -hmm. And he's one of two who were living with HIV on that tour and are still alive today, but had no one knew at the time. And the other one is Carlton Wilburn, um, the black gentleman and uh, Slam is the German gentleman. Both of them living with HIV at the time, not out about it at the time at the peak of their physical like prowess right um just incredible stories very interesting and now of course you can live with hiv it's manageable at the time people thought it was like a death sentence and it ended up being for a lot of people it was for a lot of people including one of the dancers gabriel trupin um who we'll get into next but let's talk about um slam slam is always like a, a fan favorite um, he's in the Vogue music video, both Vogue performances. All these dancers pretty much are in the Vogue music video, the MTV performance, the right. tour. Um, what else is there to say about Slam? I don't know. He just had a very, like, uh, chiseled jaw type of look <laughs> that, like, a lot of, I don't know, American young gay guys kind of were drawn to, I think. But, uh, you see a lot of him, him being a fan favorite. Yeah. I mean, I, like, Carlton stands out to me more, you know, we talk, black, Jesus-esque figure, sexualized, you know, right. Madonna, all of these things, like, well, before it was okay with any household, but, like, yeah. his, when you see him in Strike a Pose, much older, you know, three decades removed, essentially, I mean, he's still so stunning, he's very statuesque, he's a very tall dude, um, and he was one of the few that was able to maintain a career beyond Madonna. Right. Yeah, and He does all kinds of stuff from, I think, from life coaching to all kinds of dance work. Um, we'll get into the two that have done a lot of dance work. A, a lot of them have continued doing dance work, but to some to greater degrees than others. But yeah, yeah Carlton, he has this like air of sophistication about him that's like yes. really fabulous and amazing. And um, he went on to do Madonna's next big tour after this tour, which was called the Girly Show Tour in 1993 for the Erotica album. And he is incredible in that tour. Like, go back and watch the Girly Show Tour sometime. Uh, Carlton is amazing in that tour. Like, he, he's given such um, good, like, uh, material to work with in terms of choreography, staging, story, um, theming in that tour and um, he really maximizes it and he shines I think he shines even more in the girly show than he was able to in um, Blonde Ambition because he stands out even more in the girly show um, it's been so long since I've seen the girly show I need to go back and watch it fabulous that, that is a fabulous <laughs> tour too um, some people argue like what's the, what's the better one uh, Blonde Dare Ambition or the girly show I don't um, think one should be expected to answer that question. I think it's unfair. And <laughs> it's, I know the answer is Blonde Ambition, though. <laughs> Blonde Ambition was just more like the height of her celebrity and it yeah. had more iconic costuming. And um, I just feel like she was, we hadn't, we hadn't, had, we, we had built her up as a culture. We hadn't yet torn her down. 
Correct. So we, yeah. After like her sex book and the erotica album, we started, we started to tear her down. Her. This like, was, she was so bad. Yeah. Where she, she had crossed the line. It was too much for our puritanical country, mm-hmm. what, what have you. And, you know, the cry about You put rape vanilla ice so- once and then we're done with you. <laughs> right. How dare you? Um, I think it's some of still some of her best work too, like the erotica era stuff where she was really questioning um, why Justify sexual fantasy love. was not okay. Yeah. Justify My Love is arguably one of like still like the, the sickest tracks ever, but like that video is still like amazing. Yeah. And the Chihuahua so isn't. She filmed that video the same year as, as Blonde Ambition Tour. Blonde Ambition Tour like wrapped up after the summer and then she did that video in November of 1990. Um, so Not, after she got I her lips done. I they were so uh, close chronologically. Yeah, they were really close. It was probably pretty close to when she did, uh, yeah, she did that Vogue, the Vogue performance in 18th century drag for, for MTV awards um, mm-hmm. in September. And then she filmed the um, Justify My Love video in November in Paris. So you can see her lips are kind of big in the Vogue performance because she was starting to get temporary injections and they're really big in Justify My Love and a couple performances after that. But um, yeah. Let's let's not talk about her face in 2020, continue. So So we're continuing on the next, the next dancer is uh, one of my personal favorites, he is the Asian dancer, Kevin Stay, who went on to have an incredible career. He was in Showgirls, which is one of my favorite cult classic movies. He's one of the dancers in that movie. Movie um, <laughs> He also went on to work with like Shakira, Lady Gaga, Michael Jackson, everybody. He worked with all of them. Um, he did. He had a, a renaissance um, before he needed one in um, Italy with some Italian singer, singer um, pop stars there and worked with this other dancer of hers named Luca, who was in a bunch of other stuff that Madonna did um, more into the 90s uh, after Blonde Ambition. But um, Kevin is awesome. He is just the nicest guy. Like he always, um, I've always had like such a, such a great time being around him. It, it doesn't feel like I'm just like, fanning out he makes you feel like he's just hanging out with you like he's like the sweetest most awesome guy and he I feel the most connection with him for some reason because um he's also had his own music career so he did a whole like electronic music career with music videos and performances um there's a great video that he just posted where Adam Lambert is like behind him in the audience and well, that's awesome. So he this blows is my mind all the time. This guy. So that's recent. Then his music has come out like in the like past decade. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, and he hasn't like aged today. He looks so great. I mean, they all honestly, they all look pretty great. They all look um, well. Yes. Game um, and but, I, but I have an affinity for Kevin. I gotta say, he's my favorite. Um, I don't know why. I just like. I just feel the most, like, I relate to him the most, um, and I just, I don't know, I just, I just love him so much. So next we can talk about a sad story, um, Gabriel Trupin, who I think were, was all of the dancers' favorite. They, they all had a favorite. They uh, all spoke so well with him, yeah. Right, they did. He was very dear to everyone in there. They all looked at him almost like a younger brother, even though they were around the same age. He had sort of like a more, they all describe him as like an angel, really. I mean, and he did seem way more, um, like you don't see him a lot in Truth or Dare because he was he was much quieter. He was much more reserved. And uh, the famous kiss scene where they're yes. playing Truth or Dare and they dare, they dare slam to to get up and kiss Gabriel and they, they lock in like a French kiss. Uh, anyway... He passed away and there's some touching moments in Strike the Pose with his mom where um, she... Deeply sad. Yeah, pretty sad stuff. We learn in Strike the Pose that Carlton Wilburn, Gabriel Troopin, and Salim uh, Gaulius 
you were got HIV it. positive during the Blonde Ambition tour, but they all kept it a secret, all three of them, even from one another. Um, that isn't that crazy? It like is it's crazy. not. It's like knowing what we know now. It's not like shocking, but it's also like that's also crazy. Like people weren't even like comfortable enough. Oh my god, I'm just starting yeah. at the eighties and nineties. Unfortunately, Gabriel died. He died in 95 of AIDS related. And uh, Slam actually came out about his status during Strike a Pose, the new documentary. Right. So he had like a breakdown at the table with the other guys. Like, they're out about this. Why Why aren't I? And then comes out with it. And um, they all kind of learn it that way. Um, it's, it's great that Carl. It's beautiful. Did... Right. Sad, beautiful. B yeah. bittersweet bittersweet it is bittersweet and it's great that carlton and slam are living such relatively healthy lives given when they were diagnosed with right. with with hiv during a time that where you treatment and understanding was at like an all-time low right yeah so they're living their best lives now which is awesome to see in strike a pose it is and it i just at the risk of sounding redundant, like whether or not you're a Madonna fan, Strike a Pose is just like much like Lost Soul. If you've seen our um, Color Out of Space movie, our much like Lost Soul is just a great documentary for cinephiles. Like Lost Soul is a great documentary for anyone that's interested in like pop culture and dance. Um, whether or not you care any, like if you give any fucks about Madonna, like the, the narrative of these, let me take a step back. The fact that a light has been shown on these gentlemen who were not only, let's say iconic for the hundredth time, iconic, but essential to the aesthetic, the nostalgia, the, just the, the thing, like, there would be no blonde ambition. There would be no music videos. There would be no tour. There would be no MTV oh. performance without this particular group of talent coming together. Right. And they deserved their own. They deserved to have a voice, and they deserved their story for their story to be told. And Strike a Pose does that. And if you for are sure. into choreography and dance, it stands on its own removed from Madonna. The Madonna stuff is tangential, almost tangential, and it's upsetting, but it's like, my God, the, the gift that these dancers gave all of us cannot be understated. It just For sure. I'm just Definitely. so glad that they got um, an opportunity to to showcase. And, and, and when you get to see at the end of Strike a Pose, when they all finally meet up in real life and they are having dinner and drinks and you get to see them like um, uh, the reunion and- uh, you, you almost <laughs> expect Madonna to walk in the room, but- the, the, She doesn't. No, the and I think, it, yeah. I think if she did, I think if, if she had taken part in that documentary, if she had, walked in that room it would have cheapened their it would have taken i agree it would have distracted from what yeah. would, what that film should be about it's, it's, not about, it's about them yeah. i think they even say something like that and i totally agree with that um at that point it's it's not about her yeah it's about them yeah definitely agree with that but i think that she should have a dinner with them if if they're if they wanted to you know um she, she madonna should be doing a lot of things that madonna's not doing <laughs> yes <laughs> she should but it would be great for her to just acknowledge the history of that you know and just maybe just meet up with them if and there if, would or maybe be, not but but there they, would be no madonna as we know her today without these people so right. she does owe them a dinner at the very fucking least. And I would yeah. argue that... Um, Why not? Now, Why not? What else does she got to do? Um, cancel but shows. No, but, you know how long I waited to see Sticky and... You know how long she kept Sticky and Sweet waiting in Miami at um, Dolphin oh Stadium? God. 
we were we were running. Oh my like, god! Did we talk about this? But I was at that same show. No, you weren't. I was there. I was, at the Dolphin Stadium. Yes, I was there. No, you weren't. Have we ever talked about this? No, you're blowing my brain. I up. was there. Yes. Um, okay, so we were running late. We drove down. We were running a good hour late, and we I'm had blowing my mind already. And they were like, don't, don't worry. She's not even like the opening act isn't even up yet. We got there two ish hours late because there was such bad traffic getting into like, oh um, I forgot all of the cities in Florida. Um, <laughs> things like Homestead or Miami. Homestead. No, no higher up than that. Hollywood. Um, it's a sp spring break town. Fort Lauderdale. Thank you. I'm thinking St. Augustine. Once we hit Fort Lauderdale, it was gridlock because everyone was trying to get to the show. But right. we got essentially two hours late, right? And we were like, oh my God, we're going to miss Madonna. We got there. We went into the stadium and it was another hour and 45 minutes before she came on. So like, don't even get me started on this bitch making people wait. Like, I can't believe you were there and we're just- I was there. Jonathan was there too. We were both there together. <laughs> Was Yoda? Yeah. Everybody. No. Yoda was not there, but I remember they had like a oh, photo booth. booth. You could get your photos taken in a photo booth, and we did that while we were waiting for her. And I went like all the way to the back of the stadium to like look at merchandise that they had, like the tour books and all that. And I got a tour book, and I have a poster that says Miami and all that from that show. And I remember A Rod was sure. front row. A Rod, the the. Uh oh, I guy. yes, I remember when she was she, fucking A Rod. And she, yeah, so he I, was front row at that show. No, I know, I remember. Like, and I was in like I was upper upper bowl. Um, you were down on the ground. Where <laughs> where she were? I was upper bowl, and I still. That's the one and only time I've seen Madonna, and I would pay to see her again. Like, I'd that's pay all great the though. Madonna. You still you saw a great show. I mean, it was that, a good show. No, but. Yeah. This bitch does not necessarily care about her audiences. Okay, no. it's it's gotten worse over time. Even on her recent tour, it was particularly bad, and people are starting to demand, you know, yeah. answers as to why and and de more refunds and stuff. Ever a time for Madonna? If if there were ever an iteration of Madonna, whether it's Madonna as identity or Madonna in her various roles. If Madonna is Madonna through and through, or if Madonna is playing a persona, regardless, like if there's ever an iteration of Madonna that would sit down with her dancers, it's Madonna now because she's a mother. She's it like- should she, be. Yeah. She, if there's ever a hope or a chance, it's, it's the Madonna we have now. I, I see her regressing, though, at the same time. Remember when she did the Take a Bow and Something to Remember, the album Something to Remember, which was all ballads, and then she did Evita and Ray of Light, and it, she seemed so enlightened, and, like, she seemed like she had really paused and thought, but now it That's seems right. she's reverted back to, like, the antics and stuff. I think, yeah, it's it's interesting. It, it's, it's interesting because she is a mother of five kids and she's she's the most tone deaf that she's ever been which is but wild it's like wild. i i say that so we're more, more likely to get a madonna willing to engage simply because she's a mother and like she might have a little bit more empathy and time to like um consider other people's feelings but maybe not. Maybe she's still just Madonna and it's Thanks. like whatever is in her universe is her universe. I don't fucking know. Hmm. Whatever. But I, I do want to say that I think as corny as it sounds, I think Madonna has like saved more lives than she's destroyed. You know, if, if you want to look at big picture. I love yeah. that. I, I love that picture so much. I know. I'm going to show it while you talk, while you close this out. Well, I just wanted to say to everyone like Please, you know, if you're a fan of Madonna, obviously, and you haven't seen Truth or Dare, uh, fix your life. 
but also watch Strike a Pose. And if you're not mm -hmm. particularly interested in Madonna, I would still recommend watching Strike a Pose because it's such yeah. a good insight into the great documentary on its own merits. Yeah, yeah, on its own. Um, but yeah, I mean, with that being said, we, as always, invite you to subscribe, um, notification bell. We got, I, we got I just want to say real yeah. super quick, um, yeah. also Fix Your Life, if you haven't seen the tour unedited, just the tour itself, you can find it all over YouTube, just type on Ambition Tour, whatever, but the tour as, as a work, uh, un, unedited outside of the Truth or Dare documentary, but just the tour, the full length concert, it's a crime that this has not been released on Blu-ray or DVD yet in its unedited form. Um, they need to get on that stat and watch that too, because it's Listen amazing. Listen to Chad, y'all. Listen to Chad. Yeah, I need to make it a point to watch it as well, uh, the unedited version. But yeah, um, like, subscribe, comment below. Like, let's have a conversation about this. It's you know rabbit holes. Um, but yeah, we thank you so much for watching and um, stay tuned. More movie, more movie hours are coming. And um, oh, check out our Desperately Seeking Susan movie hour if you haven't already. And um, yeah, we love you guys and we will we see you on you. Cheers.